Well, welcome to the sixth annual Rose and Nicholas DeMarzo Lecture Series on Teaching Excellence. We continue to be grateful to the Blaustein School for housing us once again in this lovely location. Special thanks to Interim Provost Wanda Blanchett. So Wanda, is she in yet? Okay. Uh, and Interim Dean Clark Chin for supporting me in the work we do as the DeMarzo Chair. Uh, Afshin Shamsi and her staff are outstanding partners in publicizing and sharing information about the event, also managing the desk out front, the welcome desk. And I say every year, thank you to Colleen McDermott, who has done her usual outstanding job of making sure that all of this comes together. Remember to please join us after the talk for reception in the lobby outside of the auditorium. We are so fortunate to have Diana Hess as our distinguished guest today. Diana is the Dean of the School of Education at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'll provide a brief overview of her prodigious accomplishments in a moment, but what strikes me more than anything is that Diana not only began her career as a social studies teacher, but that is still very much who she is. She may not be in front of a bunch of teenagers anymore, but she has always been front and center at better preparing our citizenry to participate in what she refers to as deliberative democracy. The commitment to not only the study, but the practice of teaching is evidenced by the fact that this lecture has more K-12 educators in attendance and K-12 educators to be than any lecture we've ever had. Um, Diana Hess has spent the majority of her academic career at the University of Wisconsin. However, from 2011 to 2015, she joined the Spencer Foundation as Senior Vice President. In that role, she spearheaded the grants program on the new civics, a program that remains a cornerstone of the Spencer research portfolio. This was also the time period during which Diana co-authored the superbly written book, The Political Classroom with Paula McAvoy, a landmark piece of research that explores issues and practices in the teaching and discussion of controversial public issues, particularly during times of political polarization. Through, though this research began um, 15 years ago, its perspectives and implications for teaching and public discussion are likely even more important today. For researchers, and particularly for emerging scholars, this work represents the epitome of a mixed methods approach to studying social and educational problems. Uh, once you read the book, it is obvious why it won the Outstanding Book Award from the American Educational Research Association and the 2017 Grawmeyer Award for Education, perhaps the most prestigious award in education. The Grawmeyer Award is intended to stimulate the dissemination, public scrutiny, and implementation of ideas that have potential to bring about significant improvement in educational practice and advances in educational attainment. Diana's previous book, Controversy in the Classroom, was given the award for exemplary research in social studies from the National Council for the Social Studies. Diana has supported policy and research work at national, regional, and local levels. Of course, the issues that Diana has focused on are, are relevant to higher education, as, as relevant to higher education as they are to K-12. In a school of education, we regularly, let, regularly engage with politically contentious issues, such as privatization of education, deregula deregulation of teacher licensure, the organization of schools, assessment and accountability, affirmative action, civil rights, teacher dispositions, political identification and values. Even curriculum pedag pedagogy can be part of these political discussions. I know we can learn something from Diana as to how we can do the best job possible in supporting productive discussion and deliberation on these and other matters. Thank you all for coming to this seminar. It is my great pleasure to give you Diana Hess. Well, good afternoon, and thank you, Drew, for such a lovely introduction. It's an honor to give the sixth annual DeMarzo Lecture on Teaching Excellence. Over the years, I have learned so much from the excellent research and teaching and leadership here at Rutgers. And since my arrival last night, I've learned a lot 
that is going to really have an effect on me uh, over the next several years, I know. I'm amazed by the depth and breadth of work that's going on here related to civic engagement and political engagement and teaching and learning. And so I am so honored to be here. And I really do want to thank all the people who spent so much time with me today teaching me about what you are working on and giving me tips on things that I need to know about that, quite frankly, in my role of dean, I somehow missed. So I am very, very honored to be here. And I want to begin by saying that the Earth's climate is changing. In just a moment, I'm going to show you an animation from NASA that shows global temperatures since 1880, and that was the first year such measurements became possible. It shows clearly that temperatures have been rising. These rising temperatures cause polar ice to melt, sea levels to rise, and much more intense heat waves. And while virtually all climate scientists agree that climate change is for the worse and is caused by human behavior, we know that there are significant controversies about what we should do to mitigate the worst effects of climate change, not just in this country, but in many nations around the world. So let's take a look at this animation. So this is unbelievably dramatic, I think. And it's going to keep running as I say that in addition to the environmental climate changing, today I'm going to talk about the fact that our political climate is also changing. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, when political scientists or when scientists talk about climate, they refer to the average daily weather for an extended period of time at a certain location. So people who live where I live in Madison, Wisconsin, where literally it was 50 below zero a week ago Wednesday, the first time we shut down our campus in many, many years, and people who live here know that it often gets cold. And as a consequence, you need to have warm coats in your <coughs> closet. That's climate. Of course, we also know that when we get up each day, we need to listen to the news to find out what it's going to be like today. Do you need to wear that coat? And that is weather. Well, in a similar fashion, our political climate is changing and in quite dramatic ways. Now, when I talk about political climate change, here's what I mean. I'm referring to the aggregate mood and opinions of a political society over time. It's how we expect people will think and behave based on observation and research. Conversely, political weather is what happened in a specific election or the rise and fall of the importance of a particular issue. It could be a court decision or a protest over a political decision. So how has the political climate in the United States changed? Well, I think first and foremost, we are much more politically polarized than we have been in more than 80 years. And to illustrate that, I want to show you this work that was done by the Washington Post that compares how every county in the United States voted compared to the national average from 1960 to 2012. Now, the redder counties voted more Republican than the rest of the country, and the bluer counties voted more Democratic than the rest of the country. The darker the color, the larger the difference between the county and the national average. We're going to look in more detail at political polarization in just a few moments. But what I want to say is that in addition to polarization politically, we have a tremendous rise in income inequality. And those two things are linked. So when people study the cause of political polarization, one of the primary things they look at is what's happening with respect to income inequality in a country. And one tends to predict the other. Economists, as you know, are suggesting that this generation of young people may be the first generation in quite some time to expect to have a lower standard of living than their parents. We know that levels of social and political trust have decreased dramatically, and that there's intense disagreement about what needs to be done to 
develop a more functional democracy. As an example of that, I'm going to show you in just a minute some work that literally just came out a couple days ago, where people were asked what were the national priorities that they wanted the President and Congress to focus on. Now I'm going to give you a minute to really look carefully at this. When I first saw it, I unfortunately was not surprised, but I was really struck by the fact that there is just so little overlap between not what should we do about this, but what should we be working on to begin with. And I think that lack of overlap is really a problem. Now, it's not that disagreement is a problem. As a matter of fact, we know that there's a relationship between disagreement and democracy. It would be impossible to have a high-functioning democracy without disagreement. But this level of disagreement, I would argue, is really dramatically problematic because it's going to be so hard to even get agreement on what are the problems that we need to focus on. And once we do that, we know there's going to be a ton of disagreement on what should we do about a problem. So what I'd like to suggest is that as the political climate is changing, it has specific implications that are really serious for teachers and schools and students. So my talk today is going to focus on the challenges from political climate change for schools. And the reason I'm focusing on schools and not other parts of American society that are being affected by political climate change is that I think there's such an intrinsic connection between education and democracy that to not really explore that connection first and foremost would certainly be something that would be problematic. I've learned a lot about the connection between education and democracy from putting on conferences in Madison, Wisconsin before every major election. So this past September, we put on what I think was the seventh conference called How to Teach About Elections. And in that conference, teachers from all over Wisconsin and some from Illinois, some from Indiana, some from Iowa, teachers of four and five-year-olds, teachers of 17 and 18-year-olds, teachers in higher ed come together to really focus quite specifically on con and concretely on what it would look like to teach about the upcoming election in a high-quality way. Well, this year, about a month before that conference, I came home from work and turned on CNN, and then turned on Fox, and then turned on MSNBC. And I was struck that that particular day, it wasn't that there was disagreement about what should be done relative to a specific issue. It was like they were in totally different countries. That the stories that were getting attention were dramatically different. There was hardly any overlap. And for some reason that day, it worried me more than it had in the past. So I turned off the television and I said, let's think about what the conference t-shirt should say. Now, I am not a t-shirt designer. I have never had any success with this in the past. But this one, I think, is actually pretty good. And the t-shirt that we gave to the more than 200 teachers said, teach like democracy depends on it. So let me turn back to the three ways in which political climate change is influencing teachers, students, schools. And then we'll kind of dig into the details of the talk. The first is political polarization. So we're going to spend a lot of time looking at how political polarization is affecting what we do in classrooms. And I'm going to give you a warning. At a point in this talk, I'm going to stop and you're going to talk. Because there's some things that I think we need to think about collaboratively that will help us think about what teachers should do in this intensely polarized climate. Then the second challenge I'm going to talk about is the change in the media landscape. The social media landscape, but the broader media landscape, and what we need to do to deal with those changes. And the third thing is what I call the political education paradox. Now, in a nutshell, the political education paradox is that we expect schools to be nonpartisan. But 
We also expect schools, or should expect schools, to prepare young people to participate in an incredibly partisan political world. That, I would suggest, is a paradox that is challenging more now because of the way the political climate has changed than it has been in the past. So let's go back to political polarization. And I want you to take a look at this. And what you'll notice if you compare 1994 to 2004 to 2017 is that the purple is becoming smaller. That's the area in which there was overlap between what Democrats and Republicans thought, while the blues are becoming more blue and more to the left, and the reds are becoming more red and more to the right. One of the consequences of this, and I would argue that one of the causes of this, is what sociologists call the big sort. Now, the big sort is the phenomenon where in the United States and in other countries as well, not all, but in many, people are making decisions about where to live, not based necessarily on the weather, not based necessarily on what kind of job they can get, but based on where are people who are like me. So the big sort is the move for people to look for politically homogenous communities that they can join. And as a consequence, counties are becoming increasingly uncompetitive. So I'm going to take a look at this research, which is very similar to what we saw a few minutes ago, that shows what is happening in counties with respect to political participation and who people are voting for in elections. So the red counties are places where a vast majority of people voted for the Republican candidate. The blue counties are places where a vast majority of people voted for the Democratic candidate. Light blue, the majority is not as high. Light red, the majority is not as high. And look at all these places in the United States not that long ago, 1992, that are neither blue nor red. That meant that people were living in ideological, heterogeneous communities. Now, as we look over time, you'll see that we start getting some more red counties and some more blue counties. And finally, 2016. Now, this, I would argue, is a dramatic change. I think it's unlikely that this is going to turn out to be political weather. I think this is actually more long-lasting. Put another way, if we look at landslides by counties, these are counties in which 70% of the people, huge majority, voted Republican if they're red, 70% voted Democratic if they're blue, and if they're purple, there was no landslide. Now, when I looked at this map for the first time, it really challenged me empirically, because I thought, how could this be? Think back to the 2016 election. How could it be that the United States appears to be this overwhelmingly Republican country when the national election results were literally within the margin of error? So the answer to that, of course, is that the counties are different based on population. So if we adjust this for population, it looks like this. And I think we can learn a lot by looking at this. One thing we can see is the urban-rural difference in terms of people who are Republicans and people who are Democrats. Now, on the one hand, you could say, well, what's so bad about living next to people who are like you? For one thing, it would make for kind of pleasant dinner parties, probably. But the problem with it is what we know is that when you are around people who share the same views you share, you're more likely to become more partisan and more extreme in your views. 
And what we know is over time, people with more extreme views are more likely to participate. So take a look at this slide. And what it illustrates is that at one time, although there was clearly more participation politically if people had stronger views, it used to be the case that if you were kind of a weak or independent partisan, you still would participate politically. And now what we can see is that if you're a what we call pure independent, there are very few of these folks. I mean, when we look at the research on this, when people say, I'm an independent, you really look at who they voted for, almost all independents are partisans. But what we know from the research is that people are much more likely to politically participate if they're much more partisan, which means, of course, that we're going to elect people who are much more partisan, which explains, I think, why we have the difference we have in national priorities and the lack of progress that we see on what's actually being done. The other problem is that there are many different kinds of polarization. There's polarization per se, and then there's what we call effective polarization. And effective polarization simply means this. The tendency of people to say, the people who have different views than I have are not just different, but there is something wrong with them. So take a look at this. Pretty dramatic. In 1994, only 16 and 17% of people said that they had a very unfavorable attitude about the political party that was different than the one that they most typically affiliated with. And yet, by 2016, this had gone up to 55 and 58. Now, this is just not that much time in between these two extremes. I mean, to have this kind of change. And one of the things that really worries me is when asked the question, is the other party literally a threat to the nation's well-being? We had 41 and 45 percent of people say yes. So just think about what that means for a moment. That means that you're saying, it's not just that I have different views than you. It's not just that I really don't have a good view of the political party that you might affiliate with. But I literally <coughs> believe that the political party that you affiliate with is a threat to this nation. Now, when I think of the word threat in the context of democratic discourse or in the contract context of democratic theory, I often think of treason, right? I think people are kind of literally saying here, we think other people and other parties are so wrong that they're actually not good for us. So it was in that backdrop that I started the study that resulted in the political classroom. Let me tell you a little bit about that study. So as Drew mentioned, the study started quite some time ago. It started in 2005. We went into three states, Illinois, which at the time was a pretty blue state, although Illinois, like New Jersey, has a lot of variation across the state. Indiana at the time was and still is a pretty red state. And Wisconsin at the time was and still is the most politically heterogeneous state in the country which is not what you would think from reading the national news. Green Bay is the most politically heterogeneous city in the country. Now, when I was in LA a couple of, maybe six months ago, and I mentioned that to some people, they said, well, Green Bay is not a city. <laughs> you know, And if you're in LA, you, you wouldn't think Green Bay is a city. But I can promise you, in Green Bay, people think Green Bay is a city. So it turned out that this difference in the overall state political climate was incredibly helpful. And I've got to say, to be an honest researcher, we did not select these states because of this difference. We selected these states because we could drive to them from Madison, Wisconsin. <laughs> and like many civic education researchers, I started this study with, shall we say, not a very robust budget. So we were um, collecting data as inexpensively as we possibly could. So in the study, we were in a total of 21 schools, very different kinds of schools. We were in huge public schools. We were in suburban schools, rural schools. We were in charter schools. 
We were in sectarian schools and secular schools. We really had an amazing array of different kinds of schools. We were in 35 classrooms with 35 teachers, and we had 1,001 students. I've got to tell you, the day that we realized we were over 1,000, we had a big celebration. Um, and one of the things that we did in these classrooms is we tried to figure out what was the ideological mix? Because we were researching how students experienced and learned from discussions of controversial political issues compared to classes that were very similar in which issues were not being discussed. We wanted to know what teachers did and why, and then eventually we followed the kids after high school, and we wanted to find out what effect, if any, did what happen in high school have on their political and civic engagement. So when we went into the classes, we gave students surveys. And the first question we asked is, if you had been old enough to vote in 2004, for whom would you have voted? And the students who are blue would have voted for the Democrat, and the students who are red would have voted for the Republican, and the students who are gray said that they were undecided or didn't know. We thought initially that that was going to be all we needed to do, that that would tell us a lot about the ideological diversity in the class. But it turned out to be a very imperfect proxy. So in addition, we asked their views on all sorts of issues, issues related to taxation, abortion, civil liberties, the death penalty, charity compared to welfare. And at the time, the political issue of the day was whether or not civil unions should be legalized. So anytime I want to feel good about the political progress that's happened in the United States, I think back to not that long ago when that discussion sounded and looked so different than it did today when we've now had a Supreme Court case that says states cannot ban couples who are not heterosexual from being married. That being said, what we learned when we asked the kids these questions was that not shockingly, kids sometimes were all over the place. So if you look at the first student, you go all the way down, you can see that this is a student who is really hetero or ideologically lined up. But there are other students where they're as blue as they are red. And there are a lot of students who for issues, some issues, they hadn't thought about it. They didn't know. They were undecided. In fact, across the 1,001 students, about a third of the answers to these questions were undecided or don't know. And on these maps, we show them as gray. Now, I've got to say, initially, I was worried about that until we really linked our qualitative data to this quantitative data. Because I thought if you have students who are undecided about so many things, or they literally you know, just don't know, that they wouldn't want to participate. And I hearkened back to when I was a new high school teacher a long time ago, and I would ask students what they thought about something, and they'd say, I don't know. And until I became a better teacher, I saw that as not what it was. Often what it was was literal, like, I don't know. You know, I really don't know. So don't ask me for an opinion on this, because I don't have an opinion. What we realized once we really combined all of these data is that students who were undecided or didn't know were incredible deliberative assets. That if you had classes where you had enough students on a specific issue that didn't have an opinion, we saw something that we didn't see as naturally in other classes, which is those students ask questions. Because if you don't have an opinion or you don't know, and if you're in a class where everyone's talking about an issue, and if you've done a lot of work, background reading, et cetera, to prepare for that discussion, you're going to have genuine, <coughs> authentic questions. Now, Ms. Heller's class was the most purple class in the study. Let me take you to another class. So here's Mr. Kushner. So Mr. Kushner taught in a part of the United States 
that is the most sorted, S-O-R-T-E-D, in the United States. As a matter of fact, the three political precincts that fed into Mr. Kushner's high school were at the time, and I think still are today, the bluest precincts in not this town, not this state, but in the entire country. So Mr. Kushner, as you can imagine, had a lot of students who reflected their community, a lot of students who were very, very progressive on political issues. And if we look at the map, this is what it looks like. So this is very, very different from what you just saw with Ms. Heller's class. Except, even in this bluest of blue places, there are still some students who themselves are ideologically heterogeneous, and there are other students who are undecided about some issues. So it's not like there isn't something to work with here if what you think something to work with is some naturally occurring political diversity. In a third class we were in, which was Mr. Walter's class, it was kind of the polar opposite of Mr. Kushner's class. Mr. Walter is taught in an evangelical Christian high school where students and their parents had to sign a contract saying they had been saved in order to get into the school. It was a very small school. We imagined when we went into the school that it would be uh, a school that lacked any kind of diversity. And Mr. Walters taught me something that it was really important for me to learn. When I went into these classes, the first thing I would ask the teacher is, what are some of the challenges that you have? What are some of the things about the students, about the school, that make it difficult to do what you're trying to do? And Mr. Walters shocked me by saying, oh, it's the diversity. And I thought, really? Because almost all of the students were of a very similar social class. Almost all the students were white. And I said, tell me about the diversity here. And he said, oh, the religious diversity is like off the charts. I'm like, really? Because they all signed contracts that said they had to be personally saved to get into this school. But as it turned out, I was a novice to that community. And I didn't understand that there was incredible diversity within the evangelical community. And so these kids were members of different churches. They were in families where their parents had often really important leadership roles in churches. There was some real difference of opinion in these churches that to me, an outsider, looked very similar, but to Mr. Walters, an expert insider, in fact, looked very different. So, now it's your turn. I want you to imagine what was really true, which is all three of these teachers were interested in teaching their kids to talk about highly controversial political issues. And they knew that to do that well, their kids would have to hear viewpoints that were different than their own. Got that? So, what I'd like you to do is turn to a partner. If you don't already know one another, introduce yourself and talk about these three questions. What, if anything, should these teachers do differently? And what, if anything, should teachers be doing the same? Go ahead. Let's go to the second challenge that we have in schools because of climate change, which is the change in the media landscape. So one of the things we know is that young people and all of us are getting information from a vast array of sources. And in some ways, that's really great because we can learn all sorts of things. And in other ways, it's really challenging because it's hard to know what to trust. It's hard to know if something that comes over our Twitter feed or something that comes through Facebook or something that's on a website or something that's on the news or something that's in a newspaper is something that we should believe. Now, I don't think this is all that new. I think it's always been the case where we needed to really interrogate the veracity of the information that was coming to us. But we do know from research that this problem is more pronounced now 
than it's been in the past. And part of that is that it's much easier to make things look official now, to make things look warranted, to make things look, in fact, true than it's been in the past. And the most recent research on this that I think is fascinating is research that was led by Dr. Sam Weinberg at Stanford University. So he set out to figure out whether people could look at websites and assess whether the information on the website was accurate, whether the website per se was full of information that was accurate. And to do this, he found two different actual websites. The first was the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the second was the American College of Pediatrics. Now, the American Academy of Pediatrics was founded in 1930 and has 67,000 members, making it the largest organization of professional pediatricians in the world. The American College of Pediatrics is a much smaller organization founded in 2002 that supports gay conversion therapy and argues that homosexuality carries grave health risks. So what Dr. Weinberg and his team did was to recruit three different kinds of people to look at these two websites and to figure out whether what's on these websites is accurate. The first group was professional fact checkers. The second group was historians, professional historians who worked at universities. And the third group was students in higher education. And what he found, which I think is really stunning, is that with the exception of the fact checkers, neither the historians, who after all, this is what they do for a living, right? Like I remember, I was a graduate student in history, and the first day of graduate school, my professor said, we're going to teach you to be the best sleuth imaginable. Like that's what you're trained to do as an historian. And the students who were in this study were students who, for the most part, had had really high quality educations. So what happened? Why couldn't they do this? Well, the historians and the students stayed on the websites. And they said, well, it appears to be authentic. Look, it has a website URL that we've been taught in media literacy in seventh grade makes it something that we should trust. Whereas the professional fact checkers immediately got off the website and immediately started checking the veracity of the information by looking at other sources. They didn't believe that what was on that or any website was going to be accurate. They needed to triangulate in all sorts of intense ways. Now, what I think is interesting about this is what <coughs> Dr. Weinberg and his team are doing about it. They're in the process of developing and testing curriculum to teach young people how to do what fact checkers do. And quite frankly, I don't know about you, but I don't have a clue about how fact checkers learn how to do what they do. But I just hired one. She was a fact checker in the Obama White House. She fact checked Michelle Obama's speeches. And I'm telling you, she's really good. Like, she's been working for me since Monday. There's all sorts of things I say <laughs> that, as it turns out, we're wrong. So, you know, I think there is something to be said for this. Now, there's been some other research as well. Joe Kahn and his team set out to figure out whether high school students could assess the veracity of information that was on websites. And what they did was they showed content that uh, political content about an issue that was very uh, left-wing content that was very right-wing about the same issue. Some of the content was accurate and some of the content that was not, ac was not accurate. And they asked the students to see if they could figure out which was which. And what they found out for the most part is that almost all students did what I think probably all of us routinely do, which is when we read something that confirms what we believe, we think it's what? Accurate. That's called motivated reasoning. 
So you look at information, if it aligns with your pre-existing beliefs, you're much more likely to believe it's true. And these students who participated in the study were almost totally controlled by motivated reasoning, except a small group of students in the pretty large sample who had had high quality media literacy. And they had been taught by teachers to suspect their own reasoning. And they had been taught that just because something confirms what you already believe doesn't mean it's accurate. Now, I think that's great news. Because what that shows is that notwithstanding the fact that we've got a significant problem, it appears that there may be some ways that schools can actually chip away at that problem. So let's go to the third challenge of political climate change. And this is the political education paradox. So I was a public school teacher for a long time. I worked with school teachers for almost 40 years. And I am stunned by how much more difficult it is today than what it was 10, 20, or 30 years ago to deal with controversies that arise because when schools teach kids about politics, there are people who think that what schools are doing is indoctrinating kids into particular points of view. So the political education paradox is just this. We really, I think, do not want schools to have particular political ideologies. I think if we want to do that, we're really in trouble. I think we want to make sure that we're teaching young people <clears throat> how to participate politically, how to do that wisely and well, and how to want to do that. I don't think it's our job to teach students what their views should be on specific political issues. And in the research that I've been doing that goes back now more than 20 years, I have very rarely run into teachers who are doing that. Almost all the teachers that I encounter are teachers who believe that their job is to teach young people how to participate politically. They don't believe that their job is to teach young people how to have particular political views. And I think that's right. I think that's a good thing. But what's concerning now is that when people <clears throat> hear that young people in a classroom are talking about a political issue that either they don't think is actually an issue that should be talked about, or they're talking about a political issue in a way that the young people are encountering views different than they might encounter at home, I think it's seen as more threatening and more problematic than it was in the past. And here's one quick example. At a National Social Studies Conference a couple of years ago, a teacher raised her hand and said, in my school, they banned mock elections. Now, mock elections are hardly cutting edge civic education. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm actually personally a fan of mock elections, but in my experience doing this for a long time, my collections have not been very controversial. So I was kind of stunned. And then a bunch of other teachers said, oh, in my school, in my school. And when I talked to the teachers afterwards, they said, parents don't want their students to have an opportunity to vote for somebody different than who they are voting for. And I was really bothered and worried about that. I thought, boy, that, that's not a good thing. We need to convince parents and the public that, in fact, the right role of schools is to teach young people how to consider multiple and competing views. So let me end with this. That I mentioned to you before that we followed students from the study two and four years out after high school. And we worked really hard at trying to figure out how they thought about what they had learned in high school and what difference they thought it made in their lives. And what we heard is that the students who are in the very strongest classes, even the students who are in politically homogenous classes, but with teachers like Mr. Kushner, who did so many things to get the students to encounter differing views, were so happy that that had happened to them. In Mr. Kushner's class, we asked one student, do other teachers in this school do what Mr. Kushner does? Because Mr. Kushner is all about getting multiple and competing views in front of you. And this student said what is in thousands of pages of transcripts, the single most interesting session or uh, sentence. Well, in this school, I've seen every Michael Moore film twice. 
and then went on to say that that was not the case, that Mr. Kushner was similar to other teachers that the student had encountered. When we interviewed Mr. Kushner's students two and four years out after high school, they were so happy they had had Mr. Kushner because you know what, they had left, many of them, that community. They were no longer living in an area that was one of the bluest and most homogenous places in the country. And when they went out into other areas and had to interact with people who were different than they were, they recognized that Mr. Kushner had given them a lot of skills and a disposition to encounter difference that really served them well. So back to the t-shirt. The front side says teach, like democracy depends on it. And the back side says, yes, because it does. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Diana. So we have some time for a few questions. Can you talk about what Mr. Kushner actually did? Yeah, so one thing he did was he brought in guest speakers who had radically different views than the students. And initially, that did not go over well. The students really complained about it, kind of like, how dare he? And he didn't bring in like you know people who were not good representatives of differing points of view. He brought in people who had very different views, but had were working often full time on trying to enact policy changes that were different than the ones the students wanted. That's one thing he did. A second thing he did was to always put materials with multiple and competing views in front of the students and to come up with scaffolds <laughs> that required students to do that kind of preparation. He did a lot of devil's advocacy and he worried about it because he thought devil's advocacy was kind of inauthentic, but he recognized that if he didn't do that, that there would be some views that wouldn't come in the room that needed to come in the room. And the other thing he did was ferociously protect the students who had views that were different than the majority of class. He was all over those students. I mean, he would stand next to them when they were talking. He did all sorts of things that very experienced teachers do to signal that, oh, no, no, in this classroom, we want to make sure that you know that you don't have to agree to talk. And can you please repeat the question? Please? Sure, sorry. So did everyone hear that question? So I don't need to repeat it. It's a great question, and I, but let me for the, to make sure that it's being captured. So the question is, in like-minded communities, um, how do you make sure that the variance within the community is being dealt with? And that it's often difficult for that to happen because people don't want to be judged as not having the views that that community is supposed to have. Um, and you know, I see this too, and I feel it in my own work. Like I think it's it's very very easy for people to uh, you know assume that everything they think about something is the same as everything that someone else is, thinks about them if there are they are generally in the same ballpark. And what we know from new research is that if we really want to make progress on helping people learn from people who are different than they are. The best place to do it is with people who are the same as you. 
that what we often do is we say, okay, we're gonna have a good discussion about this. Let's get the most right-wing person and the most left-wing person together and see what happens. Think Thanksgiving. <laughs> Instead, one of the opportunities we have, a real affordance, is that we do have a lot of ideologically homogenous communities, but there's still a lot of difference. So if you've got on a scale of one to 10, with one point of view here and another point of view here, if you have people from six to 10 talking, you're gonna make a lot of progress. And so I think what we need to do is to hold ourselves accountable to the need to do that and to really model it in our facilitation for those of you who are teachers, and many of you are teachers, this is why it's really, really important to get a lot of people talking because once one person starts to dominate, then it's very easy for other people to think that everyone else agrees with that person. Whereas if they heard multiple and competing views, they would have a better awareness of the fact that it wasn't as monolithic as they thought. In our study, we asked students uh, in lecture classes whether or not theirs was a political ideology that others in the class agreed with. Now, we had these maps for every single class, so we knew the answer to that question. Students who were in classes where they listened thought that everyone agreed with them. Students who were in classes where they talked recognized the diversity that was in their midst. So we ended up with this finding. The important thing for teachers to do is to activate the awareness of the ideological diversity that exists in virtually any group. Along those lines, kind of a pedagogical question, do you recommend starting your semester, we're teaching at the college level, starting your semester by doing some sort of baseline measurement of what the ideology, what the what the ideological spectrum is? I don't know how you some sort of anonymous survey. Is that something you recommend? At the University of Wisconsin, we've created this project called the Discussion Project, where we're teaching faculty and full-time instructors how to lead better discussions, not just in the School of Education, but across the entire campus. Biology, chemistry, philosophy, the law school, the med school, et cetera. And we've created a 16-hour uh, professional development program that's designed to help people do a better job with discussions. And, you know, we, I mentioned this earlier today, 16 hours to those of you who are K-12 teachers, you get that much professional development every semester. But for most people in higher ed, they could go through an entire career and not have 16 hours of high quality professional development. And with that, we've developed a, a tool that we call a grouping tool that uh, faculty can download their their um, class list into, and based on the dimensions of difference that matter to them, they can put students in groups. So they can uh, think about how to get heterogeneous groups along the dimensions that they want if they want heterogeneous groups. We're working right now on how to help faculty ensure if they want to do this, that every student in a class has at some point in the semester talked with every other student. And I used to do this manually when I taught high school, and it took up way too much free time. So we're kind of excited about this. So then people are asking us, well, what kinds of things can we ask? And we are really working hard to make sure we make a responsible decision about that. Um, what is clear to me is that having this information that we got from the political classroom study was really, really helpful and really experienced teachers, they knew these maps. We asked the teachers before we showed them the maps, what do you think the map's gonna look like? The teachers who are really experienced, they knew the map. So I think teachers have ways of figuring this out. But you know, if you're teaching a class of 40, 50, 60 people, it's a different kettle of fish altogether. We did a, a very interesting study at Madison about mm, five or, it was before I went to Spencer, so maybe, maybe seven, eight years ago, where we had, um, we did know, we asked, we asked students what their views were on the issue that we were discussing in advance. And we had some groups that were heterogeneous and some groups that were homogenous. And we had some groups where they were told the point of the discussion was to try to convince people that they were, their perspective was accurate. And other groups that the point of the discussion was to try to encourage deeper understanding. Like the goal was that you better understand 
the multiple and competing views. And what was fascinating about that is that the deeper understanding discussions were much, much better. Mainly because students at Madison had gone to high schools where they had learned kind of how to do this kind of argumentation. Um, but the thing that was still, I'm still struggling with a little bit is that in some of the groups, the homogeneous groups really did a great job because in order to have a discussion, they had to push one another out of their viewpoint. Whereas in the heterogeneous groups, they didn't have to interrogate their own viewpoint as much. So you began with the graphic that showed that different um, Democrats and Republicans focus on different issues. It's not just a disagreement on a particular issue, but they just have a different thing. You talked about the media focusing on different kinds of issues. Can you talk a little bit about sort of how does how you think discussion can sort of address that sort of issue? That that there's really a, a a fundamental difference in what's important to people. So let me just repeat the question, um, which is because we know that we've got people thinking that different issues are really important, so this, this national priorities is really uh, predicted by political ideology or by party affiliation, should we teach about that? Kind of what should we do about that? And we have struggled with this a lot. When Paula McAvoy and I were writing the political classroom, Paul is now a professor at the University of North Carolina and is just really uh, amazingly wonderful curriculum designer. She was the author of the original discussion project curriculum. She decided that one thing we had to do was make sure people understood political polarization. So she designed lessons to help people understand what this phenomenon is, what it's been caused by, what, um, what it looks like, what the big sort looks like. And she thought that that was a matter of political literacy. Like if this phenomenon is having this much of an influence, we've got to name it and teach it. And I don't know if that's not going to cause people to have shared national priorities. But it is going to cause people to understand the political landscape that they're operating in. And my hunch is that that's, that's a good first step. Um, I really think it would be very hard for anyone to understand contemporary political America without really knowing a lot about political polarization. Can you put that slide back up? I mean, I think one thing that's interesting to me is that these are the, and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to articulate this, but these are the political terms for issues. There are ordinary people underlying conversations that go on that lead to what are now labeled these things. And I, I just think it'd be interesting if, if in creating conversation and dialogue, as you're saying, and the work you're doing seems so important on being able to do that, if one doesn't in part discover that there are shared concerns that underlie these issues, but that people have come to different conclusions about what needs to be done about them that have been labeled in part by the, by the political class and by the media, these things. Like I don't, so I just think yeah. that'd be an interesting, yeah. another way to think about where we are is where people land on what needs to be addressed to maybe address things that are not as disparate. Right, so the question is, what do we know about what people agree on, even though it looks here like we don't have a lot of agreement? And there's actually new work that just came out on this, too, where someone was trying to figure out, notwithstanding all these differences, are there some things that kind of, regardless of who you are, you care about? And we can see them right in the middle, right? So jobs, Medicare, Social Security, transportation. If I were a member of Congress, which clearly uh, I'm not, uh, I'd get to work on those because I think that's where real progress can be made. And I think that in our, our classrooms and in our schools, in a similar fashion, we should try to find issues that we think people agree are problems, not that they agree on what to do about them. But you know, I'm really struck when I talk with faculty, staff, and graduate students about how important uh, medical care is. You know, people are really worried, 
and they really want to make sure that their family, you know, there's no family in America that likely doesn't have somebody who's in need of, you know, really excellent medical care, or you can anticipate they will be, you know, we all will be. And so I do think there is some ground of convergence that we should really be focusing on, but I'm not sure if that was exactly your question. And I think what you're saying is interesting because I, I think that is often among people who do dialogue work, or one group of people say, well, we have to find the common ground. And in my opinion, it's going to be very hard to move forward if we only talk about the things we agree on. So I think the work you're doing of can we have it, conversations on controversial issues. I was saying these things, even the furthest apart ones, you can think people are completely interested in different things, but I think people are interested, as you say, in safety. And they have different ideas about what, right. what, are, what are threats to our safety. Right. And so they, but these words can get looked at like, oh my God, we don't have any, right. it, it's not that we, yeah, so that's what I was going to so, so we have a lot of researchers in the room, and one of the things that you can, uh, identify from looking at this is that you know there's some interesting things we can learn from this but it has inherent problems right because this is not asking people what issues we should focus on it's asking people what topics we should focus on and I think this is a huge distinction we have to be very careful to make there's a difference between topics and issues and for every topics there's a plethora of issues and it's unlikely that you wouldn't have some issue related to a particular topic be of interest to somebody regardless of what their ideological views were. Okay, last question, then we can go out in the hall. Hi, um, I was wondering if you, so when you have mentioned the political paradox in schools um, of wanting to prepare students to participate in a political environment but in a nonpartisan way, I actually was thinking that you we're going to talk about a different paradox where we are expecting educators to be educated, educating students in a nonpartisan way, but that they are people who are political, that teachers are political, and that even though we might <coughs> want or think that they could they could turn off their their personhood and to just become a teacher, that they are still political beings in whatever they do. Um, so can you talk about some of the ways that the teachers in your study manage that tension? of wanting to like authentically engage students in these discussions, but not in a way that would be leading? Yeah, I, it's such a great question. So in a nutshell, the question is that there's another political uh, education paradox, which is we want teachers to be nonpartisan, but teachers are political people as well. And how do you deal with that? Um, and I, this is a problem that like other civic educators, you know, Beth Rubin and others in this room have focused on, you know, quite a bit about how you deal with the role of teacher compared to the role of citizen compared to what you want to do with your kids. And I have uh, focused on this my entire life. I'm so intrigued by what is kind of the mother load question undergirding what you're saying, which is under what circumstances and in what way should teachers share or withhold their own political views when there's a discussion or a simulation or whatever related to a political issue going on in the classroom. And I can tell you that in a nutshell, what we learned about that is that there are excellent teachers who reach different decisions on that. So Ms. Heller told her students that she would never share her own political views, that the day she retired, she would take a full page out, ad out in the student newspaper <laughs> and they could all learn. Uh, what she believed, and the other teachers in the social studies department, similarly, as a department, they agreed on that policy. They didn't. They agreed that they wouldn't put political signs up in their yards, that they wouldn't have any bump, any bumper stickers that were political. It was really unusual and really interesting, and they did that because they really believed that it was much more important to focus on the views of the young people and much less important to focus on their own views. And so what they were trying to do was to hold themselves in check and to keep the focus on the students. And what was interesting is that their students, like all students, you know, tend to want to hear their teachers' views. 
And yet, one of the things that we found is that when teachers disclosed their views on issues, it didn't change their students' views. Now, the students were 17 and 18 years old. These were not 9 and 10 year olds, so I don't want to extrapolate at all to other ages. Um, but, and I find this just incredibly interesting and in some ways so ironic, the only thing that students change their views on was what they thought about whether the teacher should share their views. And if, <laughs> seriously, and if teachers, if they were in classes where the teacher did or did not share his or her views and kind of talked about the pol why, um, the students would shift what they thought about that. But for the most part, students didn't think that the teachers were trying to influence their views on issues, and they didn't think that they were at all susceptible to being influenced. I don't know if any of you have taught 17-year-olds, <laughs> but you know, this is, but they thought that their weak-willed classmates might change their views. All right, please join me, round of applause, and thank you so much.